Welcome to Conversations from St. Norbert College, a program that invites you into discussions taking place in your community on today's local and global issues. Now, your host for Conversations from St. Norbert College, the Dean and Academic Vice President of the College, Michael Marsden. Good evening, my name is Michael Marsden, and I'm your host for this edition of Conversations from St. Norbert College. Our very special guest this evening is Dr. Shibli Talhami, the Anwar Sadat Professor for Peace and Development at the University of Maryland College Park, and a non-resident senior fellow at the Sabin Center at the Brookings Institution. He's an expert on the United States policy in the Middle East, and he specializes in the role of the news media in shaping the political identity and the public opinion of that region. Dr. Talhami has contributed to the Washington Post, the New York Times, and the Los Angeles Times, and he regularly appears on national and international radio and television programs. His most recent book is the best-selling book entitled The Stakes, America and the Middle East, which was selected by Foreign Affairs as one of the top five books on the Middle East in 2003. Dr. Talhami received his master's degree from the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, California, and his PhD from the University of California, Berkeley. Please, welcome to our program. We're really pleased to have us have you with us and, and to have, have you also on campus for the Miller Lecture tonight, which I think is a, a, special, um, a special privilege. So, My so pleasure to be here. According to your biography, at one point in your career, you served as the advisor to the U.S. mission um, at the United Nations. And what, how did that experience, which I think happened in the early 1990s, how did that shape your career? What, what did you learn from that experience? It did. You know, it's interesting. One, of course, looks back at one's career and kind of rationalizes everything. Everything seems to be coherent and make yeah. a lot of sense. Um, I, I made sense for myself. Whether it's, you know, it's true or not, I, it's hard to know. Yeah. Uh, but I, I certainly see an evolution in my own interest. You know, I, I started off with mathematics. My undergraduate degree is in mathematics. I see. Then I went into religion and philosophy, and then I went into political science. I was always compelled by politics. I grew up in the Middle East, and it's very hard not to be obsessed with war and peace and, yeah, and, and love it. try to find an answer to these questions. And, and clearly, in the end, that's wh where, where I moved. And uh, when I was in political science, I was primarily interested in trying to understand um, uh, uh, issues of war and peace and cooperation negotiations and foreign policy. Uh, and uh, as a, a junior faculty member, I was invited to apply to the Council on Foreign Relations uh, International Affairs Fellowship, nice. which places young academics in government to get an experience. And uh, I was selected for that fellowship. And at the time, the interesting thing is that I, I was shopping to see where I might want to spend uh, the year. Mm -hmm. It ended up being a little bit more the year. Uh, I wanted to spend half of it in Congress because that's one area I didn't really fully understand about our the role of Congress in foreign policy. So then I I, I joined uh, uh, then the chairman of the subcommittee on Europe and the Middle East, uh, uh, Congressman Lee Hamilton, who's currently the president. You were an of advisor the to, to I was an advisor to him, and then I was thinking about the UN at the time, not so much. Uh, because I anticipated that Iraq was going to invade Iran and the UN is going to be the focal point and I'll be working with Tom Pickering, one <laughs> of the great diplomats, and, and I will be right uh, with him dealing with one of the most important issues of the day. But that's what happened. That's what happened. But yeah. I went there because I thought it was going to, it's the end of the Cold War. Um, this is, you know, I was, I was selected in 1989. I was aiming for the first General Assembly after the Berlin mm -hmm. War came down. I thought this was going to be a great General Assembly. It's going to define the new international order. We're going to see is what a window to see how the world is reacting, sure, what role America is going to. And people thought I was, you know, not being wise in selecting the UN because they thought the UN was an irrelevant organization. Course, yeah. And uh, it it ended up being uh, surprisingly uh, uh, important. And my stint there. Uh, because of the intensity of it, because I was um, dealing with the Security Council at a time when we were dealing with the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait and working with Tom Pickering, who's one of the, the great diplomats sure. uh, of this country uh, and, and now a friend uh, over, you know, uh, sin since then we've developed a friendship. Um, it clearly uh, interested me more 
in uh, foreign policy issues and, and advising. And since then, I've had many stints of advising in the, in the U.S. government. Interesting. Now, w with your role currently within the, the Sabin Center at the Brookings Institution, what, what are your responsibilities there? Well, the in addition to your teaching at the University, the, the truth of the matter is, even before I've had a relationship with the Brookings Institution for a long time. Okay. Uh, as you know, this is one of the premium think yes, tanks in the country. Certainly is, yeah. And uh, even before the Saban Center was actually established uh, at Brookings. Um, uh, I visited Brookings as a, a fellow on sabbatical when I was teaching at Cornell University, and uh, we started a relationship. And then when I moved to Maryland as the Anwar Sadat professor, I started a program with Brookings where we actually had something called the Sadat Forum at Brookings on the Middle I East. Okay. Uh, and then when the Saban Center uh, was uh, established as the Middle East part of the Brookings, I continued a non-resident relationship. One of the things I do there, uh, besides you know the the, the typical, which is uh, publications and, and and presentations and fora, uh, is a an annual project called the U.S. Islamic World Dialogue uh, that uh, was started, and I was one of the co-conveners. It, it meets annually uh, in uh, Doha, Qatar, and sometimes elsewhere. Uh, and it brings in uh, major uh, figures uh, from across, the from across um, Muslim majority countries, uh, Muslim communities across the, the world, and from the U.S. And uh, we have it actually scheduled for February this year, uh, and that has been a project that has been one of the one of the areas that I focus on in my relationship with Brookings. Interesting, interesting. Now you've authored what some people would argue is probably one of the best books on the Middle East. And as I said at the opening, the stakes, well, it's entitled The Stakes, uh, America in the Middle East. But one of the reviewers referred to it, and I thought this was interesting, as a well-reasoned and calm analysis. You know, So I'm assuming it's done well since it's been in what, many editions at this point. So, um, But what, what do you think the most important things uh, Americans need to know about the Middle East, and particularly about the Arab-Israel conflict well, that, that we don't know? Well, first of all, I, I, I think you know one of the things that was really uh, uh, problematic after 9/11. It was a big tragedy. It, it is a. It became sort of America's prism of pain. Yes, it was. Uh, and we it all is. went through a collective experience. And 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 what happens when you go through elective collective experience like that is you 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 have a a very narrow prism through which you look at uh, at at the world in general, but particularly at the world from which the 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 pain came. And and so in in some ways uh, it distorted our view of the Arab and Muslim world, uh, and uh, it, we, we focused more on religion. We focused more on values, when in fact, um, sure there are people out there who who are fanatical, and there are people whose values uh, conflict with them. But the vast majority of people, uh, for them, the anger with the U.S is mostly about issues and about foreign policy. And that's obvious in everything that we do and examine, whether it's public mm -hmm. opinion polls that I carry out annually in the Arab world, uh, or in the historical trends that we see uh, uh, you know, all, you, you, all, all around. Um, and, and also what we find is that you know, even as people are angry with the U.S. over issues like policy toward the Arab-Israeli issue, uh, most of them think the U.S. is a, a place they would like to live in or mm. uh, send their kids to study in, or um, not, not most of them, but a very large percentage. Even if they uh, disagree with the politics. Yeah, uh, even if they disagree with the politics. So you have, you know, it, clearly it's not a clash of value. We, we have that year after year. That's one issue that we, we needed to, to understand. But the other issue is that uh, the Arab-Israeli conflict, um, we don't quite understand its role in the Middle East. I think that's something that uh, certainly President Obama understands it. He defined it from day one as a priority issue and defined it as an Amer and, and defined the pursuit of Arab Israeli peace as an American interest. We're not doing it just as a favor to Israelis and it's Arabs. To, We're doing it as an to our collective best interest. And the reason, part of the reason for it, is that f you know historically the Arab Israeli issue is the prism of pain through which Arabs look at America, just like 9-11 is our prism of pain. Uh, the Arab-Israeli conflict is the prism of pain through which Arabs uh, look at the United States of America. 
and 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 mm. and that's that's something that is almost subconscious not even something that has to do with how they love Palestinians some of them may in fact be frustrated with Palestinians or dislike Palestinian leaders or or uh, uh, you know or, or or dislike Palestinian culture or dislike Palestinians in their own communities it's more about how they see themselves it's an identity question it is a question about um, you know, uh, when when they are making an evaluation, uh, should they like the president of France, mm -hmm. or should they like, you know, uh, the prime minister of the UK? Uh, the first test in the back of their mind is what are these people doing on the Arab-Israeli issue? So it's the uh, it's the litmus test for them. Yeah, it's uh -huh. a, it's a litmus test, and it's it's psychological it's and it's subconscious, and they do it in Morocco and they do it in Saudi Arabia, and they do it in Jordan, and they do it in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. So, um, and for that reason, that, that issue, I think, is what I call an identity issue. It's, it's an issue that really defines who they are, mm -hmm. and that's why it's important for us to deal with it. And pay attention to it. Now, as a longtime student of the Camp David Accords and other attempts at peaceful solutions, you know, do you have hope for a lasting peace in the Middle East? Do you see some real possibility there? I mean, you're a scholar who studied this long and hard, lived it. Do you have hope? Well, you know, at some level, uh, you can find a lot of hope. Uh, let me tell you, let me give you what, where you can find it. Um, I mean, if you, if you compare where governments are and where publics are today with 15 years ago, 20 years ago, there's no question that people are much closer to a notion of a two-state solution than ever. Mm -hmm. A two-state solution was not something on either the Israeli agenda or the, the Arab agenda. Uh, uh, and today you have an Arab, a unanimous Arab view in the, in the so-called Arab peace plan, which they say if, if a Palestinian state is created on the land that Israel occupied <coughs> in 67, uh, then we will recognize Israel. You have the Israeli public uh, over and over again uh, expressing uh, openness to two-state solution. Obviously, details matter. We should dismiss them, yeah, but, right, yeah. but still. Uh, and uh, the, our public opinion, even in the most recent poll that I conducted in, in 2009, uh, two-thirds of those polled uh, say they, 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 in principle, accepted two-state solution. Yeah, so, so we have, in some ways, you know, moving forward. But is the bad news, and, and that's where I think uh, a lot of the pessimism comes from, and it's legitimate pessimism. Um, the vast majority uh, now, or a, a majority, not the vast majority, actually 55 percent, somewhere between 50 and 55 percent on the, in the most recent two polls, uh, believe that the that a solution, a two-state solution, will never happen, let alone will happen. Because why? Uh, the pessimistic usually they give you two reasons. Uh, one. Uh, is that the other side would never accept it. I They're see. persuaded that the other side would. And this is, by the way, the mirror image. Israelis are like that, too. too. They, they think that uh, they're prepared, but the Arabs don't really want it. And the Arabs think. Uh, and it's a dynamic that is kind of reinforcing. Uh, and uh, the second is changes on the ground. The fact is that you have uh, proliferation of settlements in the West Bank and Gaza. You have mm -hmm. a new infrastructure of roads that is making it increasingly more difficult to get a coherent Palestinian state. Uh, and then, uh, and and you have, in addition to that, you have, uh, you know, uh, problematic uh, politics in both in both sides. You know, there you have a right wing Israeli government that has been less forthcoming. Uh, you have a Palestinian uh, politics that's divided between. Hamas controlling one part, Gaza, and the Palestinian Authority controlling the West Bank. So there are all these, you know, real facts on the ground uh, that are leading people to be pessimistic and, and making it difficult on President yeah. Obama. I, I want to come back to that in just a second. I want to remind our viewers that you're watching Conversations from St. Norbert College, and our very special guest this evening is Dr. Shibli Talhami, noted Anwar Sadat Professor for Peace and Development at the University of Maryland and he is visiting with us to talk about issues in the Middle East. What I want to follow that up with is, do you think that pre President Obama in particular is going to be able to achieve a breakthrough here? Well, you know, it's, it's um, 
Uh, I have to tell you that I'm a little bit biased here. I'll put it up front. Uh, I, I am, you know, um, advising the administration. Um, and um, although I can't say I'm having any impact on the administration. Uh, but, not they're because, but they're listening. Uh, uh, they're listening. And um, the, the truth of the matter is that, um, you know, when I look at the president, um, in some ways he comes at this issue from a very unique perspective. Uh, I, I have never seen a president of the United States who is coming, he's got a, a terrible economy that he has to deal with. Uh, he's got the health care on the agenda, two yes, wars, sir. two two ongoing two wars. Fronts, yeah. And on day one he says, I want to deal with the Arab-Israeli issue. I mean, every president wants to escape that. Yeah. You know, the advisors usually have to persuade them that it's important. So he, he understands it's important. Uh, he set an agenda for himself to get it done. Uh, and I think he means business. And the verdict is still out. Uh, I think after, you know, the first, uh, almost, a, you know, we're coming on a year yes. soon, uh, uh, nine months of active diplomacy, um, I think that uh, it's not where the administration wanted to be, uh, in part because it was dealt a tough hand, mm -hmm. uh, undoubtedly, both in Israel and, and the Palestinian areas. Uh, in part because this is always a tough issue and, and there, it, you know, a president can only do this much. Uh, no president can succeed mediating Arab-Israeli peace unless the president is invested in this issue personally and is prepared to use leverage, both with international leaders, calls, leverage, and also Congress, which mm -hmm. is important on this issue. Okay. So, uh, so, so far, uh, uh, we have active diplomacy. He, he selected, uh, you know, a, a very able American uh, diplomat, respected all over the world, uh, in Senator Mitchell, yes. uh, who is uh, fine, fine person, who's trying. Uh, but um, it's very tough. He, uh, the administration demanded that Israel uh, stop all settlement activity, mm -hmm. uh, knowing that uh, that's a major issue on the Arab yes, side. Indeed. Uh, they also requested that Arabs do some gestures toward Israel. Uh, and they haven't had a great deal of luck. And uh, so I think come Christmas, uh, I suspect that if there is no renewal of negotiation, uh, that there will be a reassessment of policy. Uh, it will be just like we're having a reassessment of Afghanistan policy, which sure. is needed. Uh, but I, I, I think that, uh, as far as I could tell, the President is determined uh, that, that he means business, uh, but it's a very tough hand. Uh, and it's always been a, 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 a you know, a, a long shot, uh, but it had to be taken. Okay. Thank you. Now, one of your areas of, uh, of interest and specialization is media coverage in the Middle East. Um, and I, if, I, if I understand your position correctly, you're critical of the media coverage, and you feel they could do a lot more to present the situation more clearly, to be able to help people better understand the situation. So how would you go about changing that? Well, actually, um, you know, the, the truth of the matter is I, I'm not so critical. I mean, I'm critical, obviously, of some media because it's always media, you know, whether it's in our country or any country, uh, you know, there are media, there's some media outlets that are more responsible than others. We won't name uh, the ones that are not. Uh, well, you know, from depends from whose point of view, too, you know, uh, that, too, you know, the, the responsibility issue. But, but and so in that sense, there's no question that there are some irresponsible media outlets in, in the Middle East, as there are in many other places. However, my main point, actually, is that the media is not the problem, that we're getting it wrong. Um, that the issue is not the media. And uh, to the extent that it is the media, it is a media that we cannot control. And it's not about putting an alternative view, because actually what is happening in the, in the Arab world, what has happened over the past 20 years, uh, is a dramatic revolution in information, where Arabs are exposed to dozens and dozens of views, more than we are, by far more than we are, because we, we don't have much diversity in our views. Uh, they have tremendous diversity. They have multiple channels coming from every conceivable Arab country. Mm. They have international outlets. Um, uh, uh, in Arabic alone, they have multiple points of views. Even from usually from a place like Lebanon, you're going to have competing views That's from right to left. 
um, and they have choices. Uh, they they can those who uh, the, you know they want to see something that's alternative. It's out there. They can even see CNN. They, even Fox News is available mm. on some of the satellites in the Arab world, and there are a number of mm. people who can speak English and watch it. So it's not that there is no uh, views available. I think what happens in the media is most people go to the media that reflect their views on core issues, not the other way around. And so Al Jazeera television that gets a lot of uh, it, that gets I have in my polls more than 50% of Arabs say it's their first choice for news. Even when they have the dozens of stations That's no, they go to that. Now, why? Well, because they understand the prototype consumer. They understand that they're dealing with a consumer they call the Arab and mostly Muslim, 300 million of them in, 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 the, in that part of the world. And they try to cater to the issues that resonate with most of them. Uh, and that's why they focus on these transnational issues, on big foreign policy issues, on the Arab-Israeli issue, on the Iraq issue, on the U.S., on themes that matter to the rest. Uh, and if they didn't, people would turn them off and go to watch sure. something else. So, uh, so I think, you know, from, from my point of view, the strategy of saying, well, let's put an American television station mm -hmm. uh, that people are going to start somehow thinking differently, uh, we, you know, that, that's not going to be uh, the case. I, to, to test this hypothesis, by the way, I just conducted another survey that I released uh, last week, which is... Um, among um, Arab citizens of Israel, those are Arab uh, Palestinian uh, citizens of Israel. These are not people under occupation. These are people who are full who remain in Israel after 48, who are full citizens of the state of Israel. And um, uh, th most of them speak Hebrew. Over 90 percent of them, according to the, uh, to, to the survey, speak Hebrew. So they have Israeli TV, the Hebrew TV, um, and they have that as an option. And many of them watch it. But on core issues pertaining to foreign policy, their views, uh, they, they still watch Al Jazeera, by the way, more. Al Jazeera, half of them, just like the rest of the Arab world, watch Al Jazeera first. And uh, their views on core foreign policy issues are not so, so different I from see. the views of, of people outside. So the point here is that... Um, uh, don't blame the media too much. We, we, we blame the media for, it's usually an intermediate variable. It's not the cause of opinion. And when people, you know, if there is an Abu Ghraib prison story that mattered a lot in the Arab world, it's not a media creation. It happened. It's a tragic event. Uh, in fact, it was first revealed by our media. The Arab media picked it up. But it doesn't matter. If it happened, mm -hmm. there's a media revolution. Somebody is going to put it on the air. Sure. And those who are going to put it on the air are going to be the ones who are going to be watched. Mm -hmm. And those who don't are going to be ignored. Mm -hmm. And Al Jazeera has been there. Uh, they, they, they're out there to cover every little story like that that they know the public want to watch. And they have the resources to do it. it so in the Gaza war, you know, in, in... They could cover it. They could cover it. They put in, you know, they can put in a dozen people to cover the Gaza war. Mm -hmm. uh, think about any major outlet from the U.S. or the U.K. or any Western country that is likely to put a dozen people to cover what was seen as a relatively small war. Uh, it's not going to happen. Good point. I want to turn to your role at the University of Maryland as the Anwar Sadat Professor for Peace and Development. Um, as an endowed professor there, what, do you have any special responsibilities that are connected to that professorship and, and, and the endowment that supports that? Do you have some responsibilities for leading public discussions or? Well, the, the, main, uh, the main spirit of this endowment, is the endowment did not have any strings attached to it in the sense that um, uh, there were no funders who said, you know, I need, we need this done. So I don't have funders breathing down my neck, so that's <laughs> always good. Well, that is very good. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I have a very good relationship with Mrs. Jihan Sadat, who was instrumental in, in working with the university to develop to that. And Mrs. Sadat, the widow of President yes. Sadat, and Dr. Sadat, she is a very distinguished lady Actually, uh, in I've her own right yes. and, and very impressive. Uh, but she doesn't have a formal, uh, uh, you know, relations, uh, you know, institutional relations other than being a fellow at the university. Um, the, 
uh, th th when I was brought from Cornell to take it on, uh, the attractive part was that I was already writing on themes of, of peace and, and development. In the Middle and East. The, in the Middle East particularly. Um, and uh, this was supposed to be a chair that marries scholarship and public policy, okay. which is exactly what I was doing, basically doing research uh, on this area, but also uh, having a voice uh, in the public policy discourse that comes from that research, whether through media or through uh, advising NGOs and government, that would be the case. So I basically um, uh, was attracted to that to that vision, and the University of Maryland is well located, has a very strong yes. uh, department, and it also is very close to to Washington. Yes. Uh, so we've uh, we, we the research has been largely in these areas, but there are some programs that we conduct. For example, uh, we have an annual lecture called the Anwar Sadat Lecture for Peace uh, that we've kept for uh, Nobel laureate types. So we've had. Um, Nelson Mandela, mm -hmm. Kofi Annan, Jimmy Carter, uh, Henry Kissinger, James Baker, um, uh, Mary Robinson, Mohammed al Barade, people of that uh, magnitude who, um, regardless of their ideological uh, position, we thought that people who had impacted world affairs, sure. and particularly on this issue. And um, actually, we're about to publish a book uh, the, through the uh, United States Institute of Peace. Uh, called the Sadat Lectures that I've edited, uh, that is going to have all of these, uh, these, these lectures, lectures in very it. Very good, very good. I was going to ask you, this is, um, and, I, and I hope this comes across fairly, but do you consider yourself a public intellectual? And, and I was thinking of, you know, some of the individuals. We had a, a guest on the show here a couple of years ago. We had uh, uh, David Halberstadt. We had... Mm -hmm. um, We've, uh, certainly some of the people like Stephen Carter and uh, you know, Richard Bernstein. I, I guess, do you see yourself both as an academic and as a public intellectual? In yes, I, I do, and, and, I, and that's the way people see me and call me a public intellectual. I am in part that, and, I, and it's deliberate. Um, mm -hmm. um, I, I have, um, I mean, it's, you know, I reflected on even when I, when I um, accepted the Sadat chair as, as a mixture of both, sure. um, uh, I believe that it was possible to be a you know, a, 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 to engage public policy without being an advocate, mm -hmm. uh, uh, to be a scholar uh, while weighing in in an intelligent way in the discourse, uh, to be moved by... So you see these as synergistic, that they really work together to accomplish a positive goal? It, they can. And I, and I think, obviously, it's not that sometimes you, you have to figure out where you draw the boundaries. Yes, uh, and, and as always, it's, it's a tough balance, yes. uh, like we all try to balance these things. Uh, but um, my view is that uh, we, and this is kind of uh, some of the questions that we have now about the academy, you know, uh, relevance of the academy. Exactly. I, I always believe that in the end I'm doing this not, I love the intellectual exercise. I have issues I want to deal with. I want to understand for me. But I also want to teach. And I don't only want to teach the students in my class. I want to, I want to teach the society in which I exist. I want I want to use that information that I have to affect the discourse, and it became especially true after 9/11 because yes. of the difficult discourse that we've had, where we needed to weigh in with information-based analysis. Uh, we've had experts come out of the nowhere. Yes, they uh, <laughs> with who are you know who are they? Uh, they well, they, yeah. they happen to visit uh, Cairo once and talk to the taxi driver on the way. And so they have a and so they have a view of Arab public <laughs> opinion. Well, we value your has a calm and well-reasoned discourse. Thank you. I okay. thank our special guest, Dr. Shibli Talhami, for sharing his expertise with us this evening. Please join us for future programs as we continue our exploration of the world of ideas. Until then, I'm Michael Marsden for Conversations from St. Norbert College.